Welcome to Popcast Deluxe, episode cat. Your, I went to your closing meeting and nobody knew you. Of Weekly Cultural Review, I'm John Caramonica. I'm Joe Coscarelli. Sava. What's up? How you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? Oh, I am. I am. I'm blessed. I've had a, I feel like last week I was a little bit like this. My soul was slumped mm. last week. Like not, not like cool slumped. Mm, fatigue. Like not slumped boy slumped. Like just like. Mm. All my my whole body was like kind of collapsing upon itself. Uh, that was not a great place to be. Uh, but I feel like I'm back. I'm like back. We're back on top. We're back. Back on top. At, like the emoji. Back on top. So uh, yeah, because last week I was on <sighs> the tail end of the second trip to Paris, back and forth in a two week stretch or like a, yeah in a two week stretch right um first time for vacation right second time for work mm-hmm. um how and, you feeling i'm st- i would i honestly might go back tonight right like when are we gonna be finished <sighs> hopefully by six god godspeed um i went to paris the second time to interview pharrell a uh, story came out on the cover of the style section yesterday. We Congratulations. Have, <laughs> thank, thank you. We have. A proof. Yeah, we uh, forgot to bring in the actual one. We're recording this on Monday. This is uh, apologies to whoever's desk we took this off of. We're, we'll put it back. Don't worry. Uh, this is the cover. Uh, it's his Room Without a Roof, a print hub special uh, on the cover. <laughs> uh, this is Pharrell in the Atelier. Uh, We're going to talk are- about the online headline. Yes, we are. Uh, and these are people who work at LV. Who are in the photo. Um, so this is the first kind of big story about Pharrell in this position. Uh, What's the exact title? Uh, creative director of menswear or men's creative director. At Louis Vuitton. At Louis Vuitton. Um, so that came out in the show. So we're recording this on Monday. There will not be commentary on the show because the show is not till tomorrow. But by the time this episode comes out, you can see the show. It you will, will have, have seen... been on the internet. It'll be on Instagram, TikToks, wherever shows are now uh, transmitted. Follow any of our friends who cover fashion full time. Uh, I'm sure they will have photos and videos. Uh, so anyway, I, I I got to spend the better part of two afternoons, sort of shadowing Pharrell for this. Um, Pharrell obviously is taking over. Virgil Abloh passed away in 2021. There has not been a permanent creative director for men's since then. Uh, Pharrell was appointed to the job in February. Uh, and this show, which is the spring summer 24 show, uh, which is happening tomorrow, this is his first kind of like statement of purpose. And what are the stakes of something like that? So we're going to, you're going to teach me about fashion, art, everything yeah. I know about high fashion and men's fashion right. in particular i know from the style section of the new york times <laughs> is this an is this a safe place to say that uh in advance of your wedding that you did not want to go shopping with me for suits because i <laughs> would take it too seriously yeah it's just you know this is like a, a, a an incredible an incredible <laughs> burn like genuinely an incredible there's burn. a lot of Overlap in our interests, mm-hmm. obviously. Uh, this is one place where we've traditionally not overlapped, which I think is is fair and yeah, fine. Yeah, look, uh, I mean, look, we're this. You're doing the best version of you. I'm doing the best version. I was of gonna me. say, like, we both have some style, but mm-hmm. I don't care about the art or the business mm-hmm. necessarily. And yeah. in fact, I think some of it is quite foolish. Yes. And sure. I think a lot of it, a lot of it. Yeah. Right. And I think that that's built in for some people, mm-hmm. but that keeps me out. But of course, I'm interested in it as a cultural phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And I'm interested in particular in the ways where it intersects with what we cover. The things we care about. Right. And mainly music, in mm-hmm. this case, uh, hip hop and Pharrell Williams at the center of all of this. Virgil also in that mix. Yeah. So I guess I'm curious from you what you feel like the stakes are, not only for Pharrell, but Pharrell taking the torch from the late Virgil Abloh, who obviously meant so much to so many. So, okay, obviously the the um, announcement of Pharrell's appointment was met with a fair amount of cynicism. There's a, a Robin Givon piece in the, in the Washington Post sort of mapping out what the problems are, which is essentially, this man is not a designer. This is... Uh, one of, if not the biggest, French luxury houses. Um, 
as far as directional clothing goes, certainly over the last few years with what Virgil was doing with LV, probably the most directional of the big houses. What and does directional clothing mean? Like like forward thinking, like innovating beyond kind of conventional silhouettes, patterns, et cetera, like moving the needle of what a luxury garment can be. Um, oftentimes Virgil was doing things that were then subsequently trickle out to other houses. I see. Um, so whether you liked Virgil or didn't like Virgil, you couldn't deny that Virgil was doing things that nobody had done in that chair. Right. Previously. Which is why he was picked for it, from what I understand. In the, yeah, I mean, in theory, I, I actually would not be surprised if LV sort of found out midway oh, into his tenure, okay. like, oh, we actually got more than we bargained for, uh, and then sort of rolled with it. There is, a, and in the story, so I spent a couple afternoons with Pharrell, but I also talked to a few people in the orbit, a couple people who work in the LV ecosystem, including the CEO, and the CEO said very plainly, I could not pick someone for this job who was just a designer. Especially okay. so in those the wake days of are over? I don't he wouldn't say those days are over, but he said specifically in the wake right. of Virgil. You cannot follow Virgil with someone who's just a designer. I see. And I thought that was striking that he said that so plainly. Um, and I think what it says is LV is a fashion business. It is about style and silhouette and fabric and color and texture and all those things, but it is a business. Right. And there are certain expectations of what the brand does that have been altered from Virgil. This is Virgil. This is not. This is duty free at the airport at Charles de Gaulle. Wow. Well, I saw it at the. I saw these at the store on the Champs Elysees when I was there. Okay. They didn't have my size. I was at the airport racing for the flight. I like saw the duty free and I was like, "Let's go." Walked in the duty free. Wow. They had it. Had it my size. I was like, "Bag them." Let's go. See, and gotta go. Me, I often wonder who is shopping at luxury fair, stores in fair, the duty free. First, first time I've ever bought a luxury item at duty free. Okay. It was just the, if it was not this specific thing, I wouldn't have bought it. But this is the first thing I've ever bought at duty free. But so now you know. All right. It's can right. I ask in general, just to set the stage for yeah. our viewers and listeners, like, Hi. what's your LV collection like, all told? Deep. I, uh, it's, it's, this is a big a part of your it's life. Careful. It's not a big part of my. It's careful. There are things, there are probably like 10 pieces from Virgil's years that feel important to me that I either bought firsthand at retail or at resale. Um, the other shirt that I was considering wearing today was in his, one of his first collections. There were a bunch of um, uh, hand-drawn street scenes, uh, young black creative types like on the streets of New York or the streets of Paris. Uh, I had been wanting one of those for a while. I finally tracked one down in my size, so I have a shirt. That was the other thing I was considering wearing. Um, pieces that, to me, speak loudly about the narrative of what, like if I can find a Wizard of Oz sweater or jacket in a reasonable size at a reasonable price, I will probably try to have right. that. Because you're the a collector garments, yeah, as much as you're a wearer. Absolutely, the, the, but the specific Virgil garments that I have tell a story right that and to me that's the most important thing um and so i wouldn't say it's not like 50 things but maybe it's 10 things that when i look at them i feel they're beautiful as garments and they also tell a story about what he was trying to do in that chair if anybody has like the deboss leather jacket from like 2022 or i'm sorry from 2021 if anybody has like the fake al wissom pelly pelly jacket and wow. wants to sell me like a 54 or 56 like, I'm here. Okay. Let me know. All right. Just We're doing deals know. here on yeah, Popcast. Yeah, yeah, just letting you lots. know. Popcast on whatimes.com. I'm here. <laughs> um, so, you know, Pharrell, the stakes, Virgil did a lot of what I would term as dismantling and recontextualizing of what the atelier can do um, and what communities it's speaking to. Right. That's and, and an who important it's piece. in dialogue with. We know, uh, coming from outside the fashion world, you know, you go all the way back to Dapper Dan. Like luxury fashion, which has never historically been presented to like young audiences, to black audiences, to like non rich European audiences, has always been recontextualized, whether in Dapper Dan's atelier in the 80s or in hip hop fashion in the 90s. It's always been part of it. What you saw Virgil start to do is take some of that playfulness and reinvention and work it right back in. And Pharrell, I think to his credit, is sort of like, I'm doing the same thing. He's not the first person to say it. But, you know, there's a, a bit in the piece where he's talking about the speedy bag, mm -hmm. which is like a small purse. 
uh, and he's remaking it in like primary colors. And he's right to be like, they do this on Canal Street. Right. Like, why shouldn't we do it? If, if they do it and people love it, we should do it and let's do it at the highest level. Yeah, he's basically saying, like, let's be in dialogue with the bootlegs and the remixes. And yes. the, oh, right. Okay. Which is, frankly, how that's all legible of contemporary to me. meme culture works. Right. You know, it's yeah. like that's how things should work. Yeah. It's a circular ecosystem. It should not be purely a top down ecosystem. So the stakes are obviously Pharrell has a real legacy, but it's. What for, is Pharrell's legacy? Okay, so no, I'm saying I'm, I, I mean to say Pharrell is inheriting a legacy. I see. Right. Okay. Um, but also, we don't want to lose sight of this, and, and multiple people brought this up to me. This is a business. Now, I do want to say LVMH, which is the parent company of Louis Vuitton, does not break out revenue by division, which is to say by brand. They break it out by category, which is to say leather goods, mm. clothing. Uh, perfumes or whatever, but they do not bring it out by brand. So you cannot say LV Men's is a multi-billion dollar business. However, it's close. I, it's I, ballpark. I, I can't. I literally can't say. Right. None of us can say. But you know, extrapolate with that. Look up the numbers and extrapolate what you will from those numbers. It is a not insignificant business that Pharrell, a person who has absolutely zero experience managing a business of this size is being put in charge of that's the real shock even if you think that he's a great designer even if you think that he's a perfect choice for the job it's not the same as i have a collaboration with adidas it's not the same as i ran billionaire boys club with nigo and we made these t-shirts and these shorts and these sneakers it's not the same. I do remember waiting in line at the BBC ice cream store wow. for the waffle sneakers. Really? I didn't buy them, but what, I was in what, I was waiting in line, line with who? Like a college friend. Okay. Uh, but I remember the thing I remember about them is they smelled like waffles. Yeah. I, I mean, Pharrell's the thing that's a I, moment. It's a moment. The thing that I'm consistently would have been consistently reminded of. When Pharrell has had these kind of in, uh, interactions with luxury fashion, obviously he's done streetwear, but with luxury fashion. He's done collaborations with Chanel, uh, Moynat, uh, which is like a French luxury leather goods house, um, Gisar, Montclair. What I'm always struck by is those pieces don't feel to me like he went into the room and there were like 10 options sitting, and he was like, yeah, yeah, that's the one. Right, so he's not it, just the figurehead, the celebrity figurehead. He does, it does feel like somehow he convinced, and this is uh, particularly true with the Chanel collaboration. I look at those clothing, those items of clothing, and think somehow he took the Chanel craftsmanship and said, can you please make something that feels like a Pharrell thing? Even the glasses, that the Chanel glasses, the Pharrell Chanel round glasses, those feel like Pharrell glasses. Mm. They happen to be made by Chanel. And the fact that he's been able to pull that off on three or four prior occasions, I thought was encouraging. Now, is Pharrell a trained designer? He is not. Were there other trained designers who were being considered for the position? Again, we can't say on the record, but if you are aware of who, who was being talked to behind the scenes, you know that some of the people who are being considered are much more conventional, normal designers. Mm -hmm. they're, they're super talented really interesting, really, in, in at least one case, a real uh, uh, silhouette provocateur, but they have classical training. Mm -hmm. Pharrell, as the head, in my mind, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, this is LVMH saying we have a huge brand to protect. I assume revenue and profits have been going up over the course of the Virgil I was going to say, is Virgil considered a success in a business sense? That's my understanding. Again, LVMH. It's private, but it's is private. the general yes. understanding? Broadly speaking, yeah. yes. I think increased visibility, right. brought new audiences in, and people who buy luxury, I, forgive me, forgive me, but sometimes people buy luxury, they'll just buy it because it's luxury. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily thinking this is the most forward thinking. This is the most, of course, uh, the yeah. narrative is the best. But I think what Virgil did is bring people into the brand who are interested in the narrative on top of people who are just rich people who buy Louis Vuitton clothes. And so I think that was considered a success. And I think it's why you're not seeing LV go in a different direction. And I think the CEO is saying essentially after Virgil, I had no choice, essentially, but to do this, to bring in someone who could bridge these universes. And Pharrell, I mean, really, if we're looking back at who 
fathered the Virgil idea, it's Pharrell and Kanye. I'm interested in where you think Pharrell sits in the culture at the moment where he's named head of LV men's. Because I think there's a lot of phases of Pharrell. And I think now, if you're a young person, mm-hmm. Pharrell Williams happy. probably happy. Because I'm happy. Come along if you feel like a room without a roof. And the, and the dumb hat. Yeah. Or the, which, like, whatever. It has, I yeah. know there's historical yeah. context to it. But, Still, like, yeah, he yeah. wore it too many times. Yeah, it, yeah, looked, yeah. it looked dumb. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> Eventually. It was too much. <laughs> it was too much. Yeah. Uh, but you think of... You think of him as like a jingly guy, right? And then you go back, a different generation knows him from the NERD stuff yeah, as sure. like fa- godfather to Tyler the Creator mm-hmm. and that generation of producer also artist. Talk, and also, I want to say Tyler also talked for the piece, which is great, great quote, amazing, incredible quote. quote. Um, Tyler was in London, FaceTimed in. Thank you, Tyler. Um, and I found it so moving to hear Tyler, a person who we often think of as maybe not taking things totally seriously, even though we know that that's not true, but in terms of public perception, yeah, just be so nakedly in awe right. of this person who, at this point, it's probably, they've probably known each other 10 years. Well, it's at this always point. been his main guy, though. Of course. But 10 years, you would yeah. think some of that would have rub, uh, been yeah. like rubbed off, yeah. but it doesn't seem that way. Yeah. He was genuinely still in awe. Yeah. And, and saying, this guy is literally breaking barriers still at this age. What does that mean for me? At my age, at my age, truly, it's no ceilings. Truly, it's limitless. Right. Great to hear. And then so we have our version of Pharrell, the earliest version of Pharrell, one half of the Neptunes, yes, changing 2000s. the sound of both rap and pop music. Yep. Totally dominant producer, mostly behind the scenes, a sort of, again, if you know, you know, mm-hmm. kind of guy, at least for a while. Mm-hmm. And his association with streetwear and specifically Japanese streetwear, yep. uh, Bathing Ape, Nigo. bringing that yep. uh, to the mainstream, birthing us in the long term, the beef between Pusha T and Drake. Oh, uh, yeah. That's, if, you're very, if, really gonna <laughs> if you're really going to dig down, lines back, that yep. starts yep. with mm-hmm. Pharrell and Bathing Ape and Clips and Wayne and Baby, mm-hmm. etc. cetera. Uh, which version of Pharrell does LV want? Do they want the culmination of all of that or do they want the happy guy? They, I think that they. Hmm. What do they think they're taking off the shelf? To, I would almost venture to say they don't know very much about the 1999 to 2004 version. I, I think to them, the Pharrell that they want is the Pharrell who met Nego, changed his whole public persona. Like they met in, I think, 03, mm-hmm. found Billionaire Boys Club, I think, in that same year. You know, we talked about that mixtape. I talk about it uh, in the article that's like 06, the mm-hmm. In My Mind prequel tape. Right. His and most that, influential. Yeah. And that probably tape his best is, work. That tape is wild. Love to my fans. You bought it, so I thank you. If you're a hater, then I'm glad that I ain't you. Couldn't see the light like baby Jesus in the manger. We wanted this life. We salivated like wolves. Slow a hundred grand and LV leather goods. Lift up the doors, open trunk, open hood. Ends a horsepower, crank it up and hear the hooves. Pharrell's a very good rapper. Yeah. He's oh, yeah. Really good. Yeah. And he was so good at boasting, but he was boasting in a way that, like, didn't quite have the thing that Jay was doing at the time. You know, Pharrell sort of said, like, I would look at Jay and look at Kanye and kind of be like, I need to be on par with them. But Pharrell is not the great technical rapper Mm -hmm. that Jay was. And Jay has that kind of effortless, like, I'm above it all. So Pharrell had to do something different. The kind of, like, literalness of the flexing on that tape is really intense. It's so, so good. Um... But then he starts to leave that behind. And by the time he gets to the early 2010s, where you get happy and then you get the Daft Punk record, et cetera, it's a different Pharrell. Yeah. But that Pharrell is moving seamlessly through the fashion industry, through, I don't know, film and television mm-hmm. or whatever. He's a much better communicator and uh, infiltrator of other spaces. And I think that's the person who LV wants. Uh, one thing that came up in... Um, I think it was the Alexander Arno interview that's not in the article was he said that no matter who he's seen Pharrell interact with or who he talked to about the potential of hiring or, or, or about Pharrell as a creative person, whether they were an artist or a fashion designer or a, you know, a sculptor or a writer or whatever, all of them had 
positive thoughts about Pharrell, but also on some level Pharrell had influenced them in a tiny, in some way or another. Sure. And that was really striking. And I think that kind of mutability, and this came up in the CEO interview as well, like Pharrell's coll ability to collaborate, that kind of mutability is, I think, crucial for them. Because I think the way that that business grows is by collaborating outwards. Uh, and this goes back to the earliest way of how Pharrell got into the house in the first place, which is in 03, 04, making the millionaires. Mm -hmm. Him and Nigo designed the millionaires. Mark which Jacobs, are? Uh, millionaires are sunglasses. Thank you. Sorry. For, yeah, for the Joes of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Millionaires are sunglasses, like an important luxury staple of an item of the mid 2000s. There are still millionaires being made today. They're different, slightly different shape, but the principle is the same. Um, that's a Pharrell slash Nego design from 0304. And that was when Mark Jacobs was running the house. And Mark Jacobs was maybe the first person to identify that, hey, the way that we're going to build LV and the way that we're going to like expand it is by bringing other people in. Mark Jacobs also brought in Takashi Murakami, who changed the LV monogram into these neon colors, uh, did, you know, neon print stuff and cherry prints and stuff. Steven Sprouse, who did graffiti bags. Like, that's how, that's a Jacobs template that then was built upon and built upon and built upon. Virgil, like, exploded it, and I think Pharrell is probably expected to continue a version of that. If you look in the photo on the cover, he's wearing flared denim, Henry Taylor, the, the painter. Mm -hmm. uh, they are um, from Henry Taylor paintings. If I'm not mistaken, the way Pharrell described it, some of them are from pre-existing works. Some of them are from works that Henry did specifically for this collaboration. I'm pretty sure there might be other uh, Henry Taylor uh, garments, either uh, now or coming, coming soon. Um, I think that's part of what Pharrell is expected to be. He's expected to be a connector, an outreach point, someone who people want to work with. Right. Even getting Rihanna in the ad campaign. Mm -hmm. When he showed, pregnant Rihanna, pregnant Rihanna holding four speedy bags and like a, a Starbucks cup. It's like this is a woman who's on the go, but she's working. Mm -hmm. She's got places to be. She's got things to do. But also she's traveling, she's traveling in luxury and style. It's a woman in a men's ad. Quote, I mean, these things don't matter. But like it's a black so, woman in a yeah. traditionally white space. Exactly. Et cetera, et cetera. You yeah. know, and, and for all, you know, he, he threw that up on the screen. He right. was just like. And, and who but and, yeah. and I think he I think what he's implicitly saying is who but me right who could do this well brings us to you mentioned briefly in passing the elephant in every room Kanye West yeah who but me yeah maybe that guy if things had gone differently, had gone differently. so you're do you want to talk about the headline yeah sure <laughs> so um you know Kanye obviously referred to himself occasionally back in the day as as uh, Con Louis Vuitton Don. Um, Kanye made sneakers in partnership with Louis Vuitton. This is also back in the 2000s. Uh, that's actually what, maybe what I should have worn today. Ooh. Probably should have worn those. Sorry. Next time. Another episode. Um, Kanye and Virgil, many, many years ago, interned at Fendi uh, as a entry point for potentially learning about how to work at a luxury house and potentially, I think in Kanye's mind, take over. Yep essentially a job like Virgil had or Pharrell has. Yeah. It's not like he was quiet about his ambitions no, at actually, any point. And Pusha sort of alludes to this in his quote in the story where he's basically like, Pharrell doesn't announce himself. Yeah. He doesn't speak. He doesn't say, I'm the best. He wants people to invite him in. Right. And this is, you know, Pharrell also sort of gets into this where Pharrell's like, I was chosen. There's a quote that didn't make it into the piece where he's like, let me tell you the difference between being chosen for something and like aspiring to something. Mm. Ouch. Which, yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. think these are all shots? I, mm, I don't know if that was. Subtle. I can't swear that the first one wasn't, but I don't think that that was. I think I, I think it was sort of like Pharrell cosmology. Sure. And, and the thing that if you spend enough time around Pharrell, which... You know, I don't know what enough time is, but I've interviewed Pharrell a bunch over the years. There is like a very uh, routinized cosmology of yeah. how he presents himself. Yeah. Uh, and and there is a cloistering of like the sunglasses are on, the prayer. Like he wants to keep certain things to himself. Yeah. I don't know what he's like behind the ch the most closed of doors. Yeah. But even in these sort of like quasi public pri public private moments, he's still holding on to things. I've got to assume some of what he's holding on to is like. Yeah, how he really yeah, feels yeah, about yeah, everybody else. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, Kanye, first of all, Kanye was in, in the large arc. Kanye was very early in agitating for this stuff. Like 
we're sitting here in 2023 having a conversation about Pharrell Williams running Louis Vuitton after three years of Virgil running Louis right. Vuitton. Which seems it normal. Seemed in, it seemed yeah. in, absolutely unthinkable at the time. Yeah. Pharrell doesn't seem as unthinkable, but it still doesn't seem totally like you're surprised to know that that could happen. When Kanye was agitating in like 07 or 09 or even like the early 2010s, it, it absolutely seemed like the most pipe dream of pipe dreams. Right. And so the one thing, and this came up a couple times with different interview subjects, both on and off the record, but like this is a job where you're in charge, but it's a job where you're working for somebody. Mm -hmm. You and have to be an employee. Yeah. You, even you, if you answer managing, to a board. Right. I mean, even if you're managing yeah. 100 people, 500 people, you're still an employee. That distinction, like, you know, having spent a fair amount of time around Ye, that's, I, that is not uh, one of Ye's strongest suits. Right. That's not it. That's not in his gifts. Yes. Um, and so I would imagine if I was the CEO of LVMH in 2010 or 2014 or whatever, and even having a meeting about it. Yeah. Even just casually just being like, let's, let's run this up the fly. Let's see what this yeah, feels no. like. My guess is that the people who sit in those chairs did not feel that that was a viable choice of an employee. That's that'd be my guess. No one has ever spoken about it on the record. I don't really know, but like my sense is that that's what that was. So to round this all out, the headline online called sure. Pharrell Williams Louis Vuitton's new Don. It certainly says that. Which is a little you, bit loaded, but it's, also a, it's also, if you, a and wink. It's, it's, look, I miss a little bit of like the old magazine days. Like when I used to, I mean, forgive me, when I used to work at Vibe, you know, we do Easter Time egg. to get you home, Grandpa. Thanks, I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, uh, when I, uh, we would love an Easter egg headline. You yeah. know, we, we wanted to wink at people who knew. Right. And one of the challenges sometimes writing about this subject matter in a place like here is you have to tell the story at the level that if you're an expert, yes. I'm providing something for you that you don't know. But if you're not an expert, it has to read seamlessly. And I think this is something you and I th think about a lot. Yeah, it's the main part of our job. It's actually so much, I would say it comes naturally now, but I wouldn't say it came naturally to me 15 years yeah, ago. Yeah, of course not. Um, and so that was a headline that I think said something to people who are in the know and said something to people who do not know and tells a similar story to both using different tools. And hopefully the rest of the story does that too. You know, watching Pharrell, when you think about what's a creative director, again, there's a lot of like chit chat of like, oh, well, he's not sketching. Sure. And it's like, well, yeah, but frankly, I think some creative directors, not all, but there are some creative directors in other houses who don't sketch or who they have a team of people, that's their job, and they're picking amongst the best options being presented to them. That is what I watched Pharrell do. Like, this is the thing. Like, the money in this piece is not me sitting and talking to Pharrell, even though we got good stuff. That's not it. It's like, what's he doing? On a day-to-day -day basis as the show know. approaches. This is the thing. That's what Crunch people time. want to know. Yes, and it was. And it was unfortunate. Like, we were sort of in a tiny bit of a, a, a fallow week or two because the clothes had not come close for the show had not arrived from wherever they're being constructed and the design part was kind of mostly done so we're catching a lot of like little bits and pieces mm -hmm. but on a fundamental level people are coming to him and saying what do you think of this here's three logo options which do you like and he's just frankly very authoritatively saying like i remember there was one that had like a sun motif and maybe the sun was coming down from the top. And he was like, no, if there's a bridge, it should be coming up over the bridge. Like, he just, like, very quickly, okay. very instinctually, like, there was or one where Vuitton was spelled out, but the O was, like, a star. And he was like, it's too, like, heavy metal band. Like, can you, like, fix the star so it's not bringing up, like, Slayer for me? And even in the he Mark... He said Slayer? Yeah, he said Slayer. Like, and even in, like, the Mark Jacobs interview, like, when I talked to Mark, and again, I think it was striking that almost everybody I reached out to to get on the phone for the story got on the phone. Because that's the kind of guy Pharrell is. He that's doesn't burn bridges. Yeah. He's man of the world. He's helped everybody at various yes. points in their career. And people want to be in his good favor. And again, we know this, and any journalist watching this knows, you can tell a lot about your subject by who's willing to get on the phone. Yeah. Especially on 
two days notice. Sure. Shout out to everybody who got on the phone in two days notice. But um, Mark Jacobs uh, brought up some of the design meetings that they had had for the millionaires. And he was like, one of the things that we worked on was that, you know, Pharrell didn't have like a classical design language. But what Pharrell did have were references. And so Pharrell came in saying, Sophia Loren. Mm-hmm. And Mark said, I, don't, I didn't know what he meant immediately, immediately, but then he kept saying Sophia Loren. And then I realized what he meant is a, is a glass shape, a glasses shape, where the arm of the glasses uh, does not come off the top, but it comes off the bottom, a different style. And he's like, he would say that, and then we figured out, oh, that's the style. And then we would move accordingly. So even if he didn't know what he meant at the moment, In exactly the most, mechanically, right. eventually think, they got there. And to there. be frank, like, look, I've been in a lot of fashion businesses i've seen a lot of mood boards i don't think a pharrell mood board at lv is any different than anybody else's mood board and the one thing about a place like lv and this is true of any luxury house at that level it's like the white house right there's a permanent staff of the white house it doesn't matter who's working doesn't matter if it's biden if it's trump if it's obama those people are there they are running the white house and then the president comes in with their team sort of like sits on top of it, manages it, and then they leave. That's what LV is like. There are people who are, and I'm not saying those people don't change or get new jobs or whatever, but like the people who design footwear, they were there six months ago. Mm-hmm. Probably a year ago, probably longer than So that. he hasn't cleaned house. No, but you can't. You he, almost he's can't. incapable of it's it. Just, right. I just not, that's not the job. Sure. He's steering the Titanic. That's well, not the Titanic. God forbid. He's steering a cruise line. Not the Titanic. (laughs) Based on what I saw, it is not the I want to be very clear. It is not the Titanic. But like those You know what I mean. Yes, but those people are permanent (laughs) staff or as permanent as any job is in the contemporary economy, right? People designing jewelry, people designing pants, people designing shoes. Like that's that's their job. They work for LV, they are designing those things, and then they are bringing options to the person who's in charge and saying, Do you like this? Do you like this? Should we go in this direction? Should we go in that direction? In that way, I think Pharrell is no different than anybody else who could have that job. Are his tools not pen and paper, but references and conversation? Yes. If they had hired a more traditional designer, could that designer have gone to those people and say, ah, no, that shape? No. And then drawn something or had one of their right-hand people draw something? Yes. But on a basic level, this is a business about taste and it is a business about business and Pharrell's good business there you at go. least up to now that's how it seems we'll see how tomorrow goes you know I can't think of a recent example in music where Pharrell has been savaged happy is you a... remember that uh Drake Rihanna remix uh what was that N.E.R.D. song the one one of the few I... Drake remixes of the last that 15 was bad. plus years that didn't go anywhere. I don't remember. Yeah, that I choose. One. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I have a lot of mixed feelings about happy as yeah. a song. I but it's dominance is it's dominance is, not up is for undeniable. Debate. You know, I and once I kind of heard like Ben Ratliff, our former colleague, like framed it as a gospel song. Mm. And once I heard it as a gospel song, I felt very differently about it. Wow. There's also gospel music that I'm pretty sure is gonna be played at the show. Uh it was released on Spotify last week. It was played for me. There's also the song. Maybe it's a clip song that's that is reference at the end of the piece. Like, you know, we'll see. Okay. You know, within the next 24 hours, like we'll see. Um, there's a music part to this whole thing, of course. too. He literally has like a studio set up, like looking out the window. He has a little he has got an engineer sitting there every day, all just, just like, at the ready. Just and you know, play yeah. this, play that. Man, it must have. be nice. Yeah, it's great. To um, be that engineer, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Looking over the window. Yeah. It's got a great just view. hanging out, yeah, just drinking buy, coffee, and waiting to... Just pressing play. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, but the goal of the piece, obviously, was to explain what he's doing. But I also think it's partially to demystify a little bit of what the job is. I think there's still a lack of understanding, especially online, about what these jobs actually entail at this level. Well, and it's tough when celebrities keep getting put into them because that just confuses people even further, I think. But I also think that um, if you have the resources of a full atelier at your hands and you're a person with like a fairly uh, voluminous knowledge or understanding of style, it is possible to use that as a, a, a weapon of design as much as pen and paper or like years at Central St. Martin's. I mean, he said this to me 
I didn't go to Central St. Martin's, but I did shop. I also did not go to Central St. Martin's, but I do shop. If anybody wants to put me in charge of something. It's I'm only open, a matter of time. I'm open, I'm open to having that conversation. How was the rest of your time in Paris? So You've never I, been there, which I thought yeah, was really interesting given really your strange, wardrobe. Really strange, right? Yeah. Okay, so prior to a month ago, I've been elsewhere in France. Okay. But I never went to Nice with 50 Cent mm. and G-Unit. What year? Oh, three. Oh, Fun. Four? Was that? Fun. Oh, yeah. Double XL cover story. Um, literally, the tour bus was attacked by fans as we were driving away. It was like one of the more chaotic things in my double XL days. 50 Cent used to be a rapper and a very popular one. Yeah, and now he's an incredibly popular television producer, yeah. but actually he was a very <laughs> famous rapper, and we'll have more on that coming soon. Um, so I've been elsewhere in France on, a, on multiple occasions, but weirdly never been to Paris. Just had not happened. So I went on vacation. And then I flew back to do this story. Yep. Um, and obviously, I tried to, like, soak up as much as possible. That was number one. Did a bunch of shopping. We'll table that for later. Um, you feel like you got a sense of the city? I do. I think, I think I was there long enough over the course of the two trips to see big touristy things, cool small things, interesting neighbor, like, like main neighborhoods, like side neighborhoods, like flea markets, et cetera. I, I think we did enough. Uh, over the course of those two trips. Um, I know, I feel like this is a little bit weird, a bit of a left turn, but, and please, Holland and Roberta and Jason, please don't, no emails. Just, this is just, I'm just a guy here. This is podcast Deluxe Art History yeah. 101. I just want to say, like, went to the Musée d'Orsay, mm -hmm. um, and I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about the Impressionists <laughs> no? in my life. <laughs> no? Over the years, I haven't spent, you know, I've done some <laughs> rudimentary art history over the years, yeah. but, it was really striking seeing the Renoirs into the Seurats. Now, when you see the Seurats after the Renoir, like it's it's real. You see, like he was like, yeah, he was like doing the Pharrell. Like he, <laughs> the he was doing the Pharrell prayers. <laughs> like he was definitely doing the Pharrell prayer hands. Like he was definitely like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all ain't ready for this. Y'all ain't ready for this. Should we put up? Can we put up? A yeah, song? you have you have some favorites. This Boy, is do your I. painting of the week. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so. <laughs> I, w I think we should look at the models, okay. which is like not like a main Surat. Uh -huh. like it's not like a, it's not canon, I don't think. How did this make you feel in the room? Honestly, destabilized. Yeah. Like genuinely destabilized. Which is what you said you wanted uh, a couple, last, a couple yeah. episodes ago. Like from seeing, art. Because you're coming out of the room that has a bunch of the Renoirs. Also, can someone explain to me why half the Renoirs are Pierre Auguste Renoir and half of them are just Auguste Renoir? Can some send me a dm or something i don't get it i don't know if it's a copy i don't know if it's a copy editing mistake <laughs> or, <laughs> something tells me they got their copy edits on the wall text down i agree so it's so i don't understand it said so, um, we're gonna learn together though. yeah yeah so okay so the bunch of renoir first of all renoir on some level is definitely on his r crumb mm, like what's like a little pervy I, i'm i'm simply saying i'm you know people out here talking about botticelli <laughs> and whatever like renoir just i'm simply saying just a little pervy let's okay so let's let's look first at dance in the country this is like a non-pervy Renoir. Okay. This is just like solid, just like solid, nice. And then you compare this to Surat, which is in the next room, I'm pretty sure, or two rooms later. So take a look at this. And then when you see that following what's in the prior room, you're just like, yo, like, bro was on. Like, he really was like, mm -mm. no, 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 all this stuff you're doing, we're past that. Wow. We're leaving in the past. It was very, very, very pointed, no pun intended. But... The person who I was like most struck by, who I did not know very much about, or actually I knew nothing about, uh, Frederick Basile, contemporary. Again, I don't know any. I know okay, less so, about this than I know about Louis Vuitton. Okay, so Frederick Basile, uh, sort of at like the intersection point from realism moving into impressionism. All his work in the museum was wild in some way or another. So there's a, a you found a, a new favorite painter in I did, real time. Genuinely, yeah. like there's a painting of this him is what, painting. This is what going to Paris is for. I agree. <laughs> That's why I wanted to talk about it. So there's a painting. Uh, it's it's his studio. It's L'Atelier de Basile or whatever it is in English. Dog, when I tell you, I stood there for like five minutes straight, completely transfixed because it's what's the on, scale? On what the scale surface, are we talking? Maybe as wide as the three photos and maybe like one extra layer. Okay. Like maybe the three, by, if it was a three by three. Maybe a little smaller, but around there. When I tell, like, so on the surface, it's just a painting of his studio and what's going on in the studio. The deploying of space 
first of all, the center of the painting is almost nothing happening. It's literally just like empty floor. There's people like sitting on the stairs. There's things that are tilted at the wrong. It's like you see him pushing back against the conventions of realism, mm -hmm. like in real time. He's like, I'm gonna show you what's happening in my studio, but everything is a little bit wrong. Everything's a tiny bit off. And it was so crazy to look at it. And everywhere you look, you'd be like, in your mind, it's supposed to look like this, but weirdly it's like this. And the center of it, where theoretically the heart of a painting is, nothing popping. Really, really intense. Right next to it, first of all, my guy painted Renoir. Okay. Painted Renoir apparently a couple times, but this one, um, and we'll put this one up. Um, What's crazy about this is like in all those sort of like realist portraits that are right before there, like these are the portraits, right? <laughs> you're gonna do your you do your pose. Yeah. Yeah. That's a realist <laughs> portrait, right? What's if you want to paint John, it's right there. It's right here. Screenshot. No, but maybe you should paint this, because what did my guy Renoir do? <laughs> this is what Renoir did. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> Uh, and and Basile caught him like that, an incredible like disruption of the traditional <laughs> realist portrait, out of control. I loved it, Baz Like, and what happened to Bas? I was like, why do I not know about this yeah. guy? Like, what's the deal? Not that I'm super studied in this field, but like, why am I not even up on this person? Yeah. Killed in the Franco-Prussian War. At oh, age you 28. hit the Wikipedia. I hit the Wikipedia. <laughs> oh my god, died in the Franco-Prussian War at age 28. Wow. And he was apparently not shown extensively during his lifetime, and only like after the fact that people kind of like get on him. I think, you know, again, everything that I just said in the last five <laughs> minutes is like 85 to 90% true. Correct us gently. Or don't. Or don't. Or just take it in. Yeah. Just take it as if yeah. we were like talking in a bar or yeah. something. <laughs> That's what this is. That's what this is. Uh, so anyway, the Musée d'Orsay, the parts that I saw, flames, learned a lot. Uh, obviously saw the water lilies at Lingerie. Okay. Right. Like, no these, these we know. Yeah, it's classics. Yeah. You don't need to look, water lilies. You know what they look like. Yeah. Monet, Monet <laughs> out here wilding. Um uh, and then the last sort of cultural thing from France that we're going to talk about. So, okay, for a little added context, um, on the second trip to France. I can't believe. I don't like leaving my house, let alone the city, let alone the country, let alone twice in 10 days or whatever. Like, miserable experience for big me. Goof, big, goofy energy. Yeah, Fair. it's not. And I know you're not, you don't like that either. I don't. But you pushed through I it. I did. It was the right thing to do. Okay, so what you may not know is the first episode of Popcast Deluxe came out while I was on my vacation. Oh, right. The second episode of Popcast Deluxe came out when I was on this work trip. I happened to be in a hotel in a second on the second trip where you could play YouTube on the television. Um, so I was playing around with the guide, and I was like trying to find something to watch. I had watched a show on the first trip, like a tattoo removal reality show. In French. In French. We were watching that. On this one, I was like, just like, actually low-key trying to find that again. <laughs> but instead, I saw something that was like, you know, like, Le Video Du Rap. And I was like, could it be? It was like on a random channel. And sure enough, at like one or two in the morning, like a block of videos, a rock of French rap videos. All drill? No. A lot of kind of like post-Drake stuff. Okay. Um, they Melodic also played... French trap. Yes. Um, they played... Um, uh, some old stuff. There was an MC Solar video that definitely okay. got played, which, you know, obviously very important. Not the biggest MC Solar fan, but like an important uh, uh, innovator in the scene. But I wanted to play what I thought was like the best of maybe like the 10 songs that I saw. And this is a, a guy named Tia Cola, and the song's called Murder. Uh, but this guy I thought was the, had like the, the crispest sound and clearest idea of how to make the song coherent. Obviously, it's like an inheritor of like melodic, like all the melodic hip hop uh, uh, in America of the last 10 years, but it felt like it sounded natural in French. Um, and I, I, I went and checked out some of his other stuff on YouTube, and I just, it, he seems like just super, super on it. So I heard a bunch of good stuff, but let's listen to a little bit of Mona by Tia Cola. Ça pose des bangers de merde, un coup de fil pour faire un merde. Ils savent qu'on est prêt pour un merde. Oh, besoin de personne pour nous aider, besoin de personne pour nous aider. C'est pas avec la force qu'on va s'aider. On a quitté la table, ils ont fait des enquêtes, on a fait des jaloux. 
Laisse pas me taper des bars quand j'entends qu'ils disent l'avenir est à nous. On a vidé des sacs, ils ont vidé leur poche, on a repris le Glock. Okay, I'm gonna take my beret off. Okay, we're done. Now. That's all. That was a lot. That was a lot of France. This is a, um, first of all, fashion, art, French rap. It's a tough, tough segment for you. No, no, There's I'm along for the ride. Okay. Like I, you know, I hope everybody I, else was excited. Like, I'm, I'm excited. interested in what you're interested in. And also, like, I, I think you're right. Like, why go to Paris if you're not going to come back incredibly excited about Basile and Tia Cola? What else we got? We have a question. Yeah, we have a question. Oh, we have a question. I should read the question. Yeah, we we have a good question. Really, really, which is timely. Timely because something we wanted to talk about anyway. I think this is from Alex Skidmore, uh, and this came, I think, from an email. Alex says a little late for the mailbag episode, but Alex, there is every week is a mailbag on Popcast Deluxe, so you're not too late. Uh, I just saw that no hip hop record or album has reached number one in 2023. Uh, first time we have gotten to June without one since 1993, which I, I think is what the Billboard article said. Related to your ongoing discussion about chart stagnation and genre, what gives? Is this coincidental absence of big releases, or is it a broader story? What, you don't like stray kids? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, first of all, get get involved in stray kids, get involved in, in hypen, yep. Le Seraphine, uh, New Jeans, 50-50, you know, get involved. A lot you, of chart action. You into here. this Jimin song like crazy that hit number one on the Hot 100 briefly not, this year? Not so much. Right. Uh, a lot of that BTS solo. So, uh, sorry, you don't want to. Just it's it's not as good as the early BTS stuff. Sorry, forgive me. Careful, ah, cut it. Uh, 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 okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it is a good question though. It's a really important question. Not a lot of rap music at the highest levels. Yeah. So far in 2023. Yeah. Uh, no, Obviously, not that many big A stars releasing records. Yeah, this so this caused a big flurry of sort of combination, hand wringing, pearl clutching, <laughs> sort of uh, hands in the ears, like this isn't happening type mm -hmm. thing. And I think there's some truth to all of it. Mm -hmm. It started from this Billboard article uh, Kyle Dennis wrote about no rap songs through halfway into June for the first time since 1983 atop the singles chart or the album chart. Right. Instead, I'll just do a quick rundown. On the singles chart, you have Mariah Carey. You have, uh, at, for the end of the year, uh, yeah, All yeah. I Want for Christmas. Mm -hmm. Antihero, Taylor Swift. Flowers by Miley Cyrus had a run. Die for You, Weekend Ariana Grande had a little moment. moment. Last Night by Morgan Wallen. Extremely weeks, long running, weeks, number weeks, yeah. one. This uh, like crazy record briefly and Kill Bill by SZA briefly. Yes. Album chart similarly a lot of SZA, some K-pop. Uh, Tomorrow together. Yep. Uh, Carol G had a week there. Mm -hmm. Midnight's by Taylor Swift. The recent the deluxe, 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 deluxe. Yes. Uh, Stray Kids, who you mentioned, and then Morgan Wallen. Thirteen weeks. Yes. Uh, with non a break in non between. Non contiguous. Okay. Where's the rap music? It's everywhere. Like, this is the thing. It's everywhere. Uh, and Wallen has obviously been a blockade at the top. But I, but I do think there is no shortage of rap music that is successful right now. Like, obviously, the Little Dirk record, the Young Boy record. Like, there are records that reflect a certain kind of ubiquity that is not totally captured in the charts. This is also slightly maybe a chart algorithm thing. Yes. Like, there's definitely some of that where they're constantly tweaking the chart. Seeing what counts, it's radio, not a pure, downloads. Like a chart algorithm is not pure. It is a, there are people in the billboard office who we would love to speak to at any time that they would Always. speak to us. Um, uh, that, and they're constantly adjusting. Yeah. Like, for example, with the chart from last week, Stray Kids are on top, but that's a lot of hard sales. Physicals. Phys yeah. Right. Which K -pop obviously K-pop is like a, a very big in K-pop. If you want to know why hip-hop is not on the top of the chart... It's in part because the way that hip hop functions is not the way the charts function. And that's not to say that maybe there isn't a slight fall off. I saw that like in the overall percentages, there's like a yeah, slight it's dip. slightly down, but it's still, it's still com huge. when combined with RB, the most consumed genre. Yeah. Um, so I think part of it is the gaming gaming, quote unquote, of the charts, or at least um putting out releases that play to the album chart algorithm is not something a lot of rappers do. That's number one. On the songs, I mean, also like Wallen, for better or worse, 
is huge and hugely hip hop influence. We should say Don't all lose almost that. all of He's these on the number dirt ones. Album. Yeah, almost on the all of album. these number ones have some element of yeah. rap in them. They're all. Po- I mean, they're Drake. They're post Drake. Forgive me, but it's like not to be like I. We said this two years ago, but it's like we said this two years ago. Like all these other genres are inheritors of hip hop's melodic turn of the 2010s. So you are hearing hip hop. You're just not hearing it from hip hop stars. Now, is that contributing to the erasure of rap music? I don't think it is. Did Drake put a record out this year? No. Did and Future yeah, put out a record this year? Right. No. They were both at number one last year on the singles chart. Search, Search and Rescue, the Drake song this year, could have been number one, but blocked by it. Mm-hmm. The behemoth that is Morgan Wallen. Right. Taylor Swift's Karma remix with Ice Spice a, in Another mm-hmm. World is a number one mm-hmm. with a rap verse on it. Mm-hmm. You know, last year you had you had a, a Dirk album at number one. You had a Tyler album. You had a Pusha T album, a Future album, a Kendrick album. Like all of this is, those are, those are the all-stars. Mm-hmm. We're sort of in this moment where we've been waiting for a new crop of all-stars and they've come largely in the form of women. You know, you have Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, the the post Megan wave of Lotto and Sexy Red and Glorilla. you know Glorilla, the huge hit makers, but who have not really become reliable album artists. No, just they're big yet. single they're big singles artists. But the, that moment may still come. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, these genres ebb and flow I, I guess, like, in an identity crisis sense, I think there is a little bit of antsiness within the genre about where this next wave of superstar is. Uh, you know, you have someone like Youngboy, who is obviously huge and has had number one albums in the past, mm-hmm. but he's sort of been putting out, dropping albums without any really care or marketing, right. um, you know, at, a, at an insane clip. You it, know. It's the definition of preaching to the choir. Exactly. These are for, for his fans uh and there hasn't been the sort of quote-unquote artist development in terms of building a new star in the genre and i i guess i i as a critic i don't think it's your job to worry about no, where that's think, coming from but i is also that right? think that, but i also think that there's one thing that we haven't talked about which is if you slightly expand the definition yeah. of like hip-hop at the top of the charts or near the top of the charts I'm not saying that Bad Bunny is or is a hip hop artist, but he certainly raps. Yeah, and reggaeton is certainly contemporary reggaeton is certainly inheriting a lot of what was happening in hip hop in the 2010s. Yep. If you listen to what Peso Pluma is doing and a lot of the sort of like new post regional Mexican music, Corridos Tumbados, Musica Mexicana, if you're listening to that, you are listening to artists who are hip hop artists. Or if you want to hear like more conventional, like Santa Fe Clan is someone who is making more conventional hip hop that's coming up sort of through a similar uh pipeline and and this is going back to you know the not to cano and forza regida and like artists like that from two or three years ago where hip-hop is being expressed in that form so if you're thinking hip-hop is not at the top of the charts or near the top of the charts i think what i would say is hip-hop is everywhere right. it's just maybe not coming through the rapper pipeline now that's not to say that won't change or come back And Drake may well drop an album 24 hours from now that changes this entire conversation. But I do think hip hop is becoming so diffuse as an influence point that it may not be meaningful to say, here's the pie chart, 20 some odd percent are rap. That may not mean, what if the pie chart is 80% are rap influenced? That might be more meaningful. I also think so much of the really vibrant exciting insane rap music that's been made over the last three years say post pandemic is not concerned with its commercial appeal you know we'll we'll talk a little bit later about stuff coming out of milwaukee yeah. uh you know the sort of post uh detroit and flint wave yep. you know mm-hmm. like v's has an album is finally going to put out his first album mm-hmm. these are cult figures you know mm-hmm. the the drill stuff coming out of a lot of different cities mm-hmm. uh bronx you yeah, know they're, they're just not they're fine to sort of live within their ecosystem, and we haven't had outside of Ice Spice the a breakout, the breakout a star like from any of these crossover. regional subgenres. Yeah, and also like we're in an interesting moment where you can be a regional star and also be an internet star, and that feels like being a global star on some level. If you're a label, like a major label, and and of course this is like an outmoded idea, but 
your job is figuring out like, well, how do I take the most popular guy in Detroit or Flint and making that person nationally palatable or globally palatable? And I think what you're seeing more and more is people are finding paths to global audiences that didn't go through that kind of process. And that global audience or even national audience might not be as big as a classic crossover radio audience, but it's not nothing. I also think it's an interesting moment for this conversation to be happening because an album came out with little notice on oh, yeah. Friday yeah, 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 that yeah. may very well be the number one album next week. Could I haven't seen the chart forecast yet. Uh, I don't know, but I think this is getting a lot of play if you look at the Apple Music charts, which always over-index uh, rap songs to some extent. Uh, he's dominating the charts there, and that's Gunna of yeah. YSL, uh, his first album since pleading out of the YSL Rico case yeah. that is currently ongoing uh, with Young Thug at the center of it. Gunna, you know, unfortunately has been at the center of a lot of conversation about snitching uh, and what it what it means to remain loyal in this sort of diffuse, ambiguous street culture that people want to see him as a part of and that he has played with in his music. Right. And, and, and not to interrupt or derail, but, but like, who are people like this is yes. I think this is the number one issue. Yes. Which is a lot of the people. I mean, raising like, questions about. Gonna, what he should or shouldn't do with law enforcement. Tr- like, uh, yeah. they are uh, internet commenting NPCs. Yes. And that's a we- that's a that's something that uh, the artists in the 90s didn't have to deal with yeah. or the 2000s. Or their rap media, and I use that term loosely, mm-hmm. talking heads, yes. uh, whose whole job it is to be provocateurs, mm-hmm. to stir the comment section. You know, I'm talking about YouTubers, I'm talking about vloggers, I'm talking mm-hmm. about podcasters, I'm talking about IG pages. And we also did an episode of Main Popcast about this a few months ago, or yeah. last year. Yeah. Uh, and and um, really, I think, anticipating on some level what ended up happening around this gun thing. So... Gunna took a, you know, what's called an Alfred plea. Uh, he didn't admit guilt, He, but he did sort of, you know, and I think what really damned him in the eyes of some of the public who want to hold him to a certain street standard was he had to answer questions from the judge as part of uh, getting out on parole, mm-hmm. saying, yes, I did X, Y, Z thing I'm accused of. Yes, these other, I have knowledge of these other people doing whatever, you know, this video gets spread around the internet out of context Mm -hmm. every other person who pleaded in this case so far did something similar uh you know gonna has a very uh and this is part just for clarity this is part of the larger ysl rico case that's being pursued in atlanta yeah in fulton county fulton county um Um, and and young thug is still uh, awaiting trial awaiting trial and what i think is really interesting is that you know, Gunna basically didn't have a choice but to address all of this head-on in the music. Uh, The album is called A Gift and a Curse. came out on Friday. What do you think? I've always liked Gunna's music. Honestly, I don't love this as a Gunna album. What I do like is I do feel like there's more texture in the lyrics. I feel like he's... I I don't think he had a choice but to address this. It is a bizarre universe because when you're addressing it, who are you addressing? Is he addressing internet personalities? Is he addressing, uh, you know, anonymous uh, commenters? Yeah, commenters on the internet who's saying that he he snitched. Is he addressing actual behind the scenes, like real figures in Atlanta without naming names? Like, is what is he doing? What is the point? The fact that he felt compelled to make a record that is perceived as addressing one or more groups, one or more of those uh, groups of people is striking in and of itself. You know, Gunna has always been, like, um, a little bit vaporous. Mm -hmm. To to his credit. Yeah, subject matter-wise. Like, really, really... Luxury. um, Yeah, like, exactly, luxury. A lot of LV. A lot of LV. Yeah. He looks great, by the way, we should say. He looks great. Uh, There's also, like, you know, Gunna has always had, like, a very... uh, idiosyncratic approach to luxury like he <laughs> that's had, a good like, way very, to put it he had a very uh, signature look with i think some rick owens that like then rihanna was it dressed she up dressed as, up as, him, up for as him for halloween yeah, like, incredible you know it's great uh so that's what gun is about and the fact that gunna now has to be this person i 
I, I don't know if that's like an artistic boon for him. I, I can't say. I don't know what's in his head or his heart, but I don't know if that's an artistic boon. I don't love this record as much as I've liked previous Gunna records, but I also, I feel like I'm listening more closely. Like, I feel like there's more to tether onto than maybe in some of the previous records that are kind of, like, you know what I mean? Like, the Gunna Little Baby record is always really, really great. Yeah. Um, but you can kind of, like, let it wash over you mm-hmm. a tiny bit because, um, like, the the textures and the melodies are really what's what's carrying it this you're kind of like waiting for the bars yeah and he does he sprinkles them throughout the album he never gets too deep because he's not really a vulnerable or uh autobiographical rapper at length yeah uh, uh, and so you see him sort of sneaking in little stuff about the case here i find it quite moving i think it's very interesting to hear gunna with his back against the wall you know, metaphorically, there's stakes here. There's tension that you don't normally get in a gun album. He's very defensive, very upset. You know, he says he has lines where he says, like, I, I shouldn't be in prison. I should be making anthems like that's like, yeah, like you're you're a great musician. Mm-hmm. You know, he, there's a, there's a track called I Was Just Thinking where he addresses Young Thug basically directly saying you know how painful it is for him to think that young thug thinks he's betraying him in some way you know so moments like that where it's like where he's not he's not speaking to this sort of to the internet uh this amorphous blob of the internet but he's speaking to his actual collaborators and loved ones and allies past and present um that's where i think this album really lands for me i think the production he's always had a great ear for production um no features on this one, which is interesting because usually he comes with little baby. He comes with mm-hmm. young thug. You know, he he has his his set of people. Um, but Turbo, his go to producer, mm-hmm. all over this one. So they are at least locked in. I think. You know, they're right. The, the lack of features is it? Yeah. Is it a, I'm taking control of the narrative, or is it nobody will? Work no, with right. Me? I think the reception to this is going to be interesting to watch. I hope that people can take gonna on his terms as a musician and not let the sort of tabloid noise, uh, you know, cloud their listening. Um, and but it's I, also probably important to remember that there's like probably the bulk of the audience doesn't even think that hard about, nor should they. Uh, yeah. It'd be better, frankly, if more people didn't think about that. Yeah, that'd be better. I agree. But I think there's some real summertime music on here. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you want to listen to one? Yeah, let's listen to Back to the Moon, which yep. is the mm-hmm. second song um, after the sort of moodier intro. And it's a hit. And hits can make a lot of things go away. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I think I think we can all wish the best uh, for Ghana in terms of putting that chapter of his life behind him. Sure. You ain't caught, gotta know how it go. Cause this shit can get triggered for show. Rich enough to get put in a hole. Got a cool, but I've been all alone. I've been driving the car from the back, taking pictures of pieces and back of the roads. And I think the little boy wanna cook, so let's crank up the beef and get back to the shows. Miami, we be beat John, it's been a busy week. Just wanted to run through a couple other headlines in music and culture from the last few days. Which Rapid I think, fire. yeah, just really hit in our wheelhouse, and yeah, we'd sure. be remiss to not touch on them. Of course. Uh, the first of which is the newest TikTok sensation, Pine Grove. <laughs> this is like, <laughs> is that your Pine Grove shuffle? <laughs> okay, Pine Grove is a band from New Jersey. This is a country tinged emo band from New Jersey. Modern emo. Modern yeah. mm-hmm. fourth wave. What wave are we on? Yes. Yeah, the la- the latest, the <laughs> second to latest wave. Troll wave. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, a song of theirs from nearly a decade ago called Need 2 started going semi-viral on TikTok combined with a strange dance called yep. the Pine Grove Shuffle. I mean, yes, I think named after the fact. I don't think, I don't think <laughs> yeah. the person said I'm going to invent the Pine Grove Shuffle. I mean, crazy. Did you find the videos moving? No, I cannot believe. Like, just I shows. I found the video so oh, moving. Oh, really? Oh, my God. But tell me why. These kids, like, in these, like, lonely spaces. The suburbs, you mean? Yeah, <laughs> like, you know, in a park or in the woods or, yeah. like, in a 7-Eleven or whatever. But just kind of, like, um, almost, like, abject anti-dance. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, Sounds like Pine Grove. And everybody kind of in communion. Like, there's a lot of, like, kind of, like, uh, split screens. Split screens or, like, 
um, what is it when you stitch a bunch together? Supercuts. Supercuts. A lot of supercuts. Shout out, Rich. Yeah. Uh, a lot of supercuts. Um, it felt like a, a global handshake of the wounded. Wow. Okay. That's a good, like I said, a good description of Pine Grove in general. Uh, what Pine Grove did, they'd recently announced that they were going on like semi hiatus because their drummer left. All bands should break up. All bands should break up. So uh, good, good on you. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Uh, but then they re released the song. In like a little EP for streaming with yeah. the sped up version and two the slow version. Sped, they did two sped up versions. Two different and speeds slow and a slow Incredible. version. For like for all your TikTok needs. Yeah, yeah. This is sort of like we we're every talking band, about. Every band should also just yeah. do this. I mean, Lana did it with a leak. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is all. Taylor Swift is releasing Cruel Summer as a single. Oh, wow. Four years later. I didn't even catch that, really? Because oh, of TikTok. all of this. Wow. Like, this is the moment we live in. Miguel, sure thing. Yeah. The biggest song on pop radio. Yeah. It's 10 years old. Mm -hmm. He's rushing out an album because his old song is so popular now. Look, the Kate Bush phenomenon. This is fun. Like, this is fun. It's playful. There's no, like, Absolutely nobody playful. should be mad about old good songs getting turned up again and totally having a agree. second life. It's actually insane, act the place that we would found ourselves in, where if a song didn't hit the week you put it out, you just let it then go. it was just dead on yeah, arrival. Of well, that's like a very modern. That's what I'm saying. I mean, let's I work these this. records, right? And yeah, like let's like let's or be like, like let the people work them, right? Or like let's be seven 1970s about it. Let's have like you know like seven record label guys be like, how are we gonna get this from number 37 to number 32? I love Who's, it. Who do we got to grease this week? Um, yeah, I agree, and it's it's actually it's been so dispiriting, I think, to talk to record label people or an industry people who are just like, oh, well, you know, it's quiet for so-and-so or it's quiet for this album because literally it didn't hit in this specific moment that yeah. it was put out. Um, and, like, we joke a lot about, like, finding the right week to release a record yeah. so that, like, you kind of, like, stay out of the way of, like, Taylor or Morgan or Drake or whoever. But it's like there's a – the desperation is real. Yeah. Because if you, it's it's an ocean out there, and if you just, like, drop – into the ocean but then eventually some you know some kid, message in a bottle washes yeah, up on kid, shore and they're like oh does, pine grove some kid <laughs> abject dances to pine grove and like here we are talking about it it's great uh the other thing that brought me in a little burst of joy yeah. in a similar mode uh was some grade a classic kardashians content so good courtney kardashian holding up a sign during the Blink-182 show saying, which watchers of the Kardashian on Hulu would know. Mm -hmm. It's been a plot line for three seasons now. They've been now. going through IVF. They've been trying to find their way towards having a child of their own. They both have children from prior relationships, yep. trying to find a way to have a child of their yep. own. When you saw the sign which said, Travis, I'm pregnant, yep. you, the band stopped, he goes down, he kisses yeah, yeah. her, etc. Did you catch the reference right away? Yeah, yeah, or did you knew it from the sight? 100%. All the small things video, which is like the... Brain. I didn't remember. Oh, really? Until I saw... Like, I, I was oh. like, oh, this is cute oh. on its own. Yeah, and yeah, then... No, no, it's all the small things. This is a Blink-182, maybe the the first truly big crossover hit. It's it's not the first Blink-182 hit, but it's the one that becomes the TRL staple. It's the one that basically ensures that we are still talking about Blink-182 today in 2023. And not a coincidence that in the video they were mocking the other TRL videos of the time. Right. I mean, it's this is, like, you think about 1999, you have TRL pop stars and you have a, a sort of, like, dare I say, Remora-like set of anti-pop stars, which include Blink-182 and includes Eminem, who are making the very subject of pop celebrity, I mean, the very uh, topic of pop celebrity, their primary subject. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of meta narrative, sure. especially in early Eminem, uh, as he's getting famous, that anxiety is creeping through. And this is not an anxious video. This is a sort of hilarious video that yeah. you know someone either in there in the band or at the label or in management was like, you know how we could really take advantage of the fact that people care about what's my age again? Yeah. Make is, fun of the Backstreet Boys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and like MTV is going to eat that up. Yeah. And indeed, MTV ate that up. It turned Blink-182 into pop stars. Again, we would not be talking about Blink-182 today had this song not hit the way that it hit. Now, in that video, there are a lot of reference points for the pop stuff of uh, the big pop stars of the day, but there's also someone in an audience scene at a show 
holding up a sign. I actually thought the sign just said, I'm pregnant, but then that doesn't make any sense because who would it be addressed to? Right. An episode sign says, Travis, Travis, I'm pregnant. pregnant. Yeah. Courtney Kardashian, I, I mean, I'm sure someone. There's a mood board somewhere oh, yeah. that has the well, Travis. Well, this is I'm my pregnant. favorite part. There's a pregnancy mood board oh, that yeah. says Travis I'm pregnant. And then she shows up at the concert with the signs as Travis I'm pregnant. The production design. Like this is classic Kardashians in the sense that like whoever did it did it right. Mm-hmm. So like the font matches. Oh, on the side. You know, oh, like it's good. the the attention really to good. detail is really like good. this is why the Kardashians are still on television. Because really, when they really choose good. to do one of these stunts, oh, yeah. it do always it. hits. Do it right. And the great thing that they do as well, which longtime longtime viewers will know, is they link their real life tabloid moments with the arc of the show. Oh, of course. So the show, even though it was filmed prior, I just want to say I wrote about that very early in it, my old LA Times television column. It's, Dig it up. I mean, it's an, it's it's really, an really art great. that they kind invented. of invented, invented and, and perfected. Hundred percent. So as you're watching the Hulu show about Courtney trying to get pregnant, here comes the TMZ post about Travis. I'm pregnant. Congratulations to the happy couple. We wish them well. 11 out of 10. Yeah. Truly no notes. Yeah. All right. We're getting close to landing the plane. We got to do songs of the week. This is a bumpy flight. Bumpier than to or from Paris either time. I I, I do want to say the flights. Okay. Very smooth. First class. I am a New York Times employee. Yeah, you, no. know that, you know that's not in the budget. <laughs> I just didn't uh, know if maybe you were like, all right, I'm going to upgrade this time. No, I did. On, it's too expensive. On what, we're not made of money. We're, made, we're wearing LV. One of us is wearing Well, I will time. say on the vacation <laughs> we one, spent all our I money. paid, I used miles to get okay. like a decent seat. Yeah, yeah. But no, on the company dime, no, we just. No. No, we flew with the luggage. Yeah. <laughs> um, songs of the week. Yeah. What do you got? Milwaukee rap. That sounds like yes. Atlanta rap. Yes. Certified Trapper. Yeah. New mixtape. Certified Trapper is a YouTube sensation. Find the channel. Go down the rabbit hole. He makes a lot of different music, but this is to me his most focused pop song so far. Trapper of the Year, the opening track on his new mixtape. Same name. Takes me back to 2009. Even earlier, maybe? Oh, interesting. Young L.A., Young Dro, Black Ooh. Boy, White Boy mixtape. Like, wow. this really triumphant moment uh, in, yeah. some people call it swag rap. Just just good vibes. Yeah. Uh, he does, you know, there's, there's a little, there's some boasting here that's really funny. He says uh, that you can't compete with him because you make 100K a year, which... Totally respectable yeah. upper middle class income, <laughs> but not to certified trapper. In uh, who's America? <laughs> I listened to this song like twenty times over the weekend, just on loop while yep. I was cleaning the apartment. Um, just puts me in a good mood. Summer's here. Let's go. I will say before we get to my song of the week, like I actually didn't love Trapper of the Year. I like a lot of songs later in the tape a lot better. Uh, it's a really good mixtape. Uh, the the record with uh, BLP Kosher, Kosher Certified. I can't get in on BLP I know, Kosher. I understand, but we'll save it for a later episode. It's a separate episode. <laughs> I really like that song though. Palm Angels. I think yeah. it's really really good. My bad. There are a number of songs in this I really I didn't like love the title track, but I but I I really into what he's doing. I will say also self produce the title track. Oh, okay. So you know. Also, who is doing Certified Trapper's uh, illustrations? I actually was texting about this over the weekend because there's a handful of new mixtapes that have this same aesthetic, and I'm trying to find out if who's it's the, the same person's? guy or if they're all ripping each other off. Unfortunately, a lot of these rappers don't credit their graphic designers. So well, throw the like at a, on the posts, guys. And also, I mean, this reminds me, look, in the sort of peak mixtape era in the 2000s, yeah. uh, you never really knew the designers were. And they were but always were amazing. Couple, but there were a couple of books that came out. There's one that's yet to come out, but then there were a couple of books that came out a couple of years ago, which I wrote about, which really credit the designers of those covers. Yeah. Sort of like a long recovered history. Yeah. So definitely recommend looking into that and looking out for... The book that's coming out, I think on, uh, I think it's 
uh, Evan's book called Rizzoli, I think. Forgive me if I'm wrong, but that'll come out soon. But yeah, these illustrations, the Trapper of the Year cover, the Kosher Certified cover. Is this Frico Rico? It's not Frico Rico. I don't know. I'm not sure. Anyway, whoever does it, uh, we're fans. Absolutely. Um, what do you got? I, something sad. Okay. So Big Pokey died the other day. Rest in peace. Yeah. Big Pokey uh, is a rapper from Houston. Um, one of the surviving members of the Screwed Up Click. Uh, Houston had one of the most vibrant hip hop scenes of the 90s and the 2000s, uh, partly coalescing around DJ Screw and the rappers who uh, he would put on mixtapes. Um, and then there was uh, the North, that was South Side, the North Side, and Swisher House, and sort of like loose um, uh, multiple scenes in the city at the same time, but the sound was very similar. Um, and Houston has had a tremendous amount of influence. That slowed sound has had a tremendous amount of influence. But uh, there's been a lot of tragedy in that scene. A lot of those artists, D.A. Scrooge died in 2000, I believe. A lot of the rappers who were central in that scene died extremely young. Um, Big Pokey, who was one of the better freestylers in that in that whole scene, um, had a couple of really good albums in the late 90s, early 2000s. Check out um, Hardest Pit in the Litter, um, if you haven't heard it. In the 2000s, as Houston was kind of like getting bigger and crossing over into the mainstream, you know, you're Mike Jones and Paul Wall and Slim Thug and so on and so forth. Like, I, I reported a big story down there about what was happening in the city in uh, kind of in the post-screw era. Uh, that's That was in Spin Magazine. I spent a lot of time. I have a tremendous amount of personal affection for that music. It's, it was very, very formative for me um, in the 90s and 2000s. Um, so Big Pokey is one of the, was one of the last surviving members of the Screwed Up Click. Um, and he passed away a couple days ago and it got me back listening to <sighs> DJ Screw's June 27th tape, uh, which is just one, basically it's just long freestyle, a lot of different artists. Um, and it's widely regarded as like one of, there are hundreds, maybe like 200 screw tapes. I, I don't know the number, forgive me. Um, but one of the classic screw tapes. Um, and so I, I think we should listen to Pokey's part of the June 27th freestyle. Um, and you might recognize, uh, I guess we'll play the part that ends up being picked up for Sitting Sideways, which became a hit for Paul Wall later on. Um, so this is Big Pokey, June 27th freestyle from DJ Screw's June 27th. Sideways, boys in the days. On a Sunday night, I might bring me some maze. Baby, old days, oh, they going crazy. Some say I'm lazy. Wanna have my baby. Ain't gonna get me locked down. I can't get Sad note to go out on, but I think maybe we can save it with some food. A little palate cleanser. Or not cleansed, <laughs> to be frank. Um, so I know I said the Paris content was done. But the Paris content wasn't done because, uh, you know, I did not come back from France. So we got two options here. We got the uh, the Lay's Saveur Poulet Roti. So that's chicken roti, uh, savory chip. And 3D Bugles. I know you're a bugle guy. Big bugle Close guy. listeners know John's a big bugle guy. Huge. Uh, bacon flavor. Good. Good. I this mean, I think it's fitting. I don't speak French, but I think it's fitting that it says gout, gout on, on the package. The <laughs> Truth in advertising. Yeah. Um, this, I think, will be fine. That's going to be absolutely unwell. I wish I had a toothbrush. Whoa. Whew. I can smell yours from here. Unbelievable. <laughs> and mine. <laughs> they can smell this. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie definitely gets my this is insane. This is unreal. I don't even know if I need to taste this. I know I already, I ta already, I already taste, taste it. Yeah. All right, you're gonna go first. All right. Mm. 
Mm. Tastes like a bugle. Really salty. Okay. Strong kick. Not that intense up front. How bacony though? Smoky, but not that meaty. Should I just try that first? Yeah, take a bite. All right. No colors. No artificial aromas. You're reading in French? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I took a five in AP French literature. All Thank right. you very much. All right. Um, they smell like pork rinds. Yeah. They smell like pork rinds. But porkier. Wow. Oh, yeah. You All like right. that? Oh, yeah. You think you could eat the whole bag, though? Oh, yeah. Really? Watch me. All right, I'm trying the chicken. Wait, wait, wait. We got to put a number on this, though. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, this is a, this is an eight and a half or a nine. You love it? Oh, yeah. I'm rocking with these. I'm ordering these on, like, whatever random exotic web. Hell, yeah. Okay. No, no, You're all is, in. New this fave. Is, this is this is wavy. I'm rocking. I put it at, like, a seven. I like it. So Nothing good. wrong with it. I don't think I could eat the whole thing. Too intense. All right, I'm going to do the chicken now without a palate cleanse because I feel like... No, we just got to go in. Yeah, we just got it. The smell on these is out of control. It's almost like they put the smell in the bag with regular chips and then sealed it <laughs> and let it seep into the chip. That's kind of... I was going to say they're well marinated. This is like a good mm. roast chicken. It's really good. Really good. You remember when the Lay's did the limited edition Grimaldi's pizza thing? Yep. That was like unexpectedly like rich flavor? Yep. Kind of feel like this is the same. This is like umami out of control. Mm. Yeah. Really good. Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna give this an eight and a half. I love it. I agree with you that it's well done. I don't know if I love it. I'm going to go seven and a half. But they really like. You have no idea how intense this smells. I really feel like I'm eating a chicken, a whole chicken. I literally will be smelling this tonight. Like, in be- like I'll be smelling this. I'll be waking <laughs> up in the middle of the night smelling this. I'm sorry. Seven, seven and a half. Good snacks, though. Shout out, France. Y'all did that. Y'all really killed it. Whew. That's our show. Back next week? Oh, yeah. We'll be back. Oh, yeah. We'll see you then. Uh, every podcast ever is at nytimes.com slash podcast. We, us, on YouTube, youtube.com slash at nytimes. Check it out, uh, Popcast Deluxe. Email us, podcastnytimes.com with questions. Get in the Discord. Get in the Facebook. tinyurl.com slash podcast discard or slash podcast Facebook. Subscribe to Popcast. That's Original Recipe and Deluxe. Anyway, you get your audio content. There's an audio feed of this as well. Although, why would you do that when you can look at Yeah, us? watch it. YouTube. Watch us. Don't watch TV. Watch us. Uh, but all of that's on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, Stitcher, etc. Leslie Davis is our executive producer. Uh, and thank you to her. And thank you to Karen Gans and Pedro Rosado and the whole gang. And uh, yeah. We're back next week.